I've been blessed to work with um, some very significant brothers. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, bless and peace to his soul and living spirit and legacy. And of course, I worked for 30 years in the United Church of Christ. But I have to say, when I met the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, for the first time in my life, I met a minister and a brother who knew how to minister to brothers and knew how to be a brother unto ministers. I'm not going to use a whole lot of fancy words, but I want us to know today, in 2007, we are blessed as a people to have with us a man who has and continues to speak out, raise our level of understanding of ourselves and of our God, and to promote and to encourage us to be on the right path. It's truly a blessing, and I'm honored to have the responsibility to present our brother, our minister, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Thank you very much. Thank you. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we give him praise and we give him thanks for his mercy and for his continued intervention in the affairs of human beings that whenever any member of the family strays from his path before he punishes he always raises from among that people a prophet or a messenger to guide that people back to the path of his divine favor and this is why we thank God for all of his prophets, particularly Moses and the Torah, Jesus and the Gospel, Muhammad and the Quran. Peace be upon these worthy servants of God. I, as you know, am a student of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I thank Allah for his intervention again in the affairs of black people in America who have been the victims of the worst and most cruel form of human bondage, where the mind and the spirit of a people was broken and a people destroyed a people lost from their God, lost from their culture, lost from their history, lost from their names, their language, their native land and people, turned inside out and upside down to be made a mockery of by their former slave masters and the slave master's children. And now this people, who were once destroyed, have found favor with God, as he has always favored the enslaved, the oppressed, the downtrodden. And he has favored us not just with a prophet, but with his presence. And out of us chose one to lead, teach, and guide us to the path of his divine favor. And with that presence, 
He's offering to us the scepter of rulership. That that which was not becomes that which is. And that that was the bottom rail, he will bring it to the top. And that which was last, he would make it first. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. I thank Allah for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I thank Allah for each and every one of you who are present, for those who organize this brunch, for those who sacrificed to pay for this brunch, I am honored to be here with you, and I greet you all with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, uh, Brother Minister Benjamin, for your kind introduction. I thank our sister for her beautiful poetry. I thank our brother who was nervous for his wonderful song and the beautiful lyrics. I thank Allah for the greatness that is in this room, the power that is in this room, the leadership that is in this room, but above all, the potential that is in this room. I am honored by the presence of the Reverend Dr. Michael Dyson, who has always been a defender of the hip hop community and a guide for that community. <laughs> and a brother who recognizes the extreme value of who you are. So this morning, I want to talk to you about your value. And I want to encourage you to be the light that produces a revolution. Now, the word revolution sometimes inspires fear. But we not, shouldn't be afraid of that word if we properly understand it. Jesus was a supreme revolutionary. All of the prophets created a revolution. A revolution only means a complete change that brings a thing back to its original point and position above all with God. Who are you? Hip hop masters. Who are you? As I look at our people and what we've been through in America, I think America would be absolutely tasteless without our presence. We lend so much to everything that we are involved in. We give something to football that was never in football when it was all Caucasian. We give something to basketball. We give something to the classics. We bring something to everything that we get involved in because we are naturally creators. We are children of the creator. And we are the first of his creation. So we are direct descendants of God. So everybody likes to hear black folks sing especially when we sing songs of the Lord. Nobody can sing the spirituals, the gospel, 
like us. Nobody can preach the gospel like us. There's something about us that's unique and magnificent and original and causes others to follow us, even if it's downhill. <laughs> but as I look at our suffering, and I think about God and how he uses pain to bring new things to light, new creations. Nothing of value comes without pain. It was your mother and mine that brought us into this world through pain. And even though the pain was such that it imitated the pain of death, and sometimes mothers wanted to die because the pain was so great, but in a moment when birth came, the pain was forgotten because something new and beautiful had come into existence without the pain of slavery we wouldn't have had what they call Negro spirituals. The spirituals were born out of our pain and our longing to get out from under a wicked slave master and return to where they took us from. So steal away, steal away, steal away to Zion. I ain't got long to stay here because it's a, a deep river and my home is over Jordan. Oh, don't you want to go to that promised sky? No, that promised land where all is peace. Our ancient fathers and mothers pass messages on to the other slaves. Everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Heaven, heaven. Our folk knew how to use what the slave master liked to get a message over. Chicken George wasn't Chicken George. Chicken George was a master because he understood the master. And he played the game for the master with his fiddle, but his aim was always, I got to be free. I got to get past this wicked master. And if I can trick him by saying yasa when I mean no sir, then I'll get where I'm going. Well, pain. Pain produced the blues. And everybody, you know, especially those of us from the South, in those honky-tonks with white lightning, and we love to hear the pulsating rhythm of the blues. Huh? I lost my baby. Ah. Everything that made us sad, we put it in a song to communicate the depth of our hurt, the depth of our pain, the depth of our despair. Our poets, Langston Hughes and all the others, they spoke out of pain. They created out of pain. And they moved the people out of their pain. Who are you? Black folk got into church Massa didn't want us in no religion. But when he decided we could become Christians, he said, yes, make them Christians. Not to make us more like Jesus, but to make us more pliant by tricking us by the way they used scripture. 
If they smack you on one cheek, you be sure, turn the other. Well, who was smacking us? Love your enemy, but who was the enemy? Pray for those who were despitefully using us, but who was using us? And if they come and get you, ask for your pants, give them your cloak too. In other words, a perfect doctrine to make a better slave. And so those of us who became preachers, they loved us because we were brilliant, we were eloquent, but we had to preach a gospel that didn't rile the slaves. Don't uh, stir up the plantation. And then that Turner read the Old Testament. And then Mark Vesey read the Old Testament began to say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and the fighting spirit was born they wanted to kill the master we didn't want no peace with the master kill him and let's be free well Nat is gone Denmark Vesey is gone that spirit is dormant, but it's ever present. But the enemy knows this. He knows what he has done, and he's wise. He knows that if you plant the seed of corn, you can't get back wheat. He knows that as a man soweth, the same shall he also reap. So he's watching for that spirit that he knows must come because he cannot stop terrorizing. He cannot stop uh, exploiting. He cannot stop killing because that is the nature of the enemy. The enemy will never make you free to become his equal. You got to free yourself. Listen to me because I don't have a lot of time. God brought me back from death to serve a purpose because we're at the end of this. And you have a big role to play. You are the leaders. Whether you want to be or not, God has chosen you, and through your pain, you speak. Jazz came out of pain. And look at what we did. Listen to our jazz artists. The way they move around chords. Well, the white folks copy it now, I mean. And now they're moving that to the side for some kind of new form of jazz that speaks to them, but not to our great artists who gave jazz to the world. And then there was bebop. Oh. And last came hip hop. All born out of our pain. Public enemy heard a word. Brother Malcolm heard a word. Brother Malcolm was a thug before he heard the word. But Malcolm was not a thug in his nature. He was a thug by circumstance. He wanted to be a lawyer. And when his teacher asked him, Malcolm, what would you like to be? He said, I would like to be a lawyer. Why a lawyer, Malcolm? I want to fight for my people. But the teacher said, oh, Malcolm, if you became a lawyer, my people would never hire you, and your own people would not trust you. But you would make a wonderful carpenter. You see, carpenters can't threaten white power. 
So it's good that you be a carpenter. It's not a dishonorable trade. It's just non-threatening until you try to build for yourself. <laughs> it's all right to be a plumber. It's all right to be a brick mason. But when you start building your own communities, uh, now this is threatening. So my, my dear hip-hop artists, managers, producers, record label owners. Who are you and what is your function today? Public Enemy heard a word. KRS-One heard a word. Big Daddy Kane heard a word. Professor Griff heard a word. And when they heard the word, the word inspired new thought. Yeah, pain. But then they started rapping. There wasn't no beat to it then. It was just spitting out lyrics. But the lyrics were powerful. And the lyrics were not popular in those circles that produce us. So they were producing themselves. They were distributing themselves and becoming rich. And so those who always watch us for trends, what's the new trend among them? I won't use the word that they use, but what, what is the trend among them? Oh, it's called rap. Bring some of it, let me hear it. It'll take a whole nation to do what, Griff? When they, when they took that in the room, they said, we can. Well, the Negroes are listening to this. <laughs> Why, if they keep listening to this, our police won't have work to do. They're going to start building something of value. How do we fix this? Well, you know, in the Quran, which is the book of scripture of the Muslims, it always talks about how Satan plans. The Bible does it too. You know, how he takes a thing and wisely, skillfully turns it so that the thing that you thought was going in a good direction, he turns it so that it serves his general purpose. Now, today, he's much wiser than he was, but his game is still the same. He's much wiser than he was. But so are you, but still being tricked. You see, Satan is so smart, you know. I'm sure you saw the movie The Godfather. And whenever he wanted to get his way, he gave them an offer that they couldn't refuse. And you know how we are. We're a people that want to be loved. We're a people that want respect. We're a people that want to move in our community. And the people in our community say, whoa, there he is. There she is, my man. So we keep adding things to ourselves for respect because they're emptiness on the inside. The Bible says you cannot add one cubit to your height. You can put on stilettos, but in the end of the day, you got to take them off and realize that you are what you are. You understand what I'm saying? And you can add extensions to your hair. But at some point, reality says it may only be an inch or two. But thank God for the Koreans. <laughs> uh, 
a little levity is always good. But I'm getting to the point of your value. You see, the enemy saw our brother from Louisiana, Master P, becoming a millionaire, and they weren't promoting him. They said, if they don't come into our distribution system, then these Negroes will find out they don't need us. And if they find out that they don't need us, then they'll become independent of us and we won't be able to tap the rich resource of their creativity. My son one day said, Daddy, do you know anything about the kings of comedy? I said, no, son, I haven't heard of them. You know, I'm in the Bible all the time. I'm in the Quran all the time. And sometimes you lose touch, you know. So I got these children that keep me in touch. They said, Daddy, I want to put on the kings of comedy for you. And I sat down and. And I saw my brother Steve Harvey, and I saw Cedric the Entertainer, Bernie Mac, and, and Hughley. Thought it was a little raunchy. <laughs> but the thing that I saw was their consciousness. These are some of the most brilliant men who understood the reality of what we were facing, put it in comedy, but the kings of comedy were raising the consciousness of our people. And the moment the enemy saw that, he said, let's give them an offer that they can't refuse. And most of us as children of slave parents, we want notoriety even more than money. So we end up with notoriety and no money. Now, now brothers, diamonds are girl's best friend. And, and diamonds have value, especially with the dollar falling. So bling bling may not be a bad thing. Oh, that rhymed, didn't it? <laughs> But when you put on your bling bling, see, you do that to say something. Because there's emptiness here. See, you don't need a diamond if you shine it. You don't need gold if you are the standard of value. We only need these external things to cover the nakedness of our being. A soul that needs to be fed. A mind that needs to be taught. A people that need to be raised. So the enemy brought our brothers out to Hollywood and gave them a comedy show on Fox. That's Mr. Murdoch. Very wise. Very wise exceedingly wise well now once you get the money see the money is always there to blind you but you don't look behind the money you look at the money and he prints it every day it takes a few cents to print hundred dollar bills by the thousands and he'd drop it in your lap and you say, oh, 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 I got it now, brother. So then he calls you in and he said, well, here's the new writer for your show. And as the writer writes, the edge of your consciousness begins to be cut off. And as the writer writes, you find yourself a modern step and fetch it. 
As the writer writes, you're funny, but you're stupid. So he's taken a conscious man and cut him down and made comedy now comedy with no purpose when before it was comedy with purpose. And that's the same thing that he did with hip hop. Now, you are a part of a game that's bigger than you. Your talent, your genius is being manipulated to create conditions that make your people less than what they should be and less than what they could be. And they make you wealthy beyond your dreams to make you think that wealth means that you're right. So you can drive a big car, live in a big home, have money in the bank, and that makes you think, well, I must be doing something right. Now you got your women messed up. You got your men messed up. We now are thugs. We now love guns. We love to call our women bitches, and we love to call them hoes. We love to call each other nigger, and we try to make nigger acceptable. How could a nigger be acceptable? Except in your mind. Listen to me good. See, in the 60s, the language changed. And when the language changed, the behavior changed. We didn't call each other nigger. We called each other brother. We didn't call each other bitch. We called each other sister. So when you call your sister, sister, and your brother, brother, then you got to stop thinking, if this is my brother, can I kill my brother? Can I rob my brother? But a bitch I can kill and a whore I can sell. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. Don't take it like that because I'm in love with you. But I love you enough to warn you that there's something better that God is requiring of you for the treasure that he put in you. Now let me close this. The people walked in darkness, gross darkness, the people. Isaiah the prophet. This people that walked in darkness upon them hath the light shined. Light is that which creates motion change revolution jesus said i am the light of the world so anybody that really knows jesus is a revolutionary those who talk his name but are not a part of a revolution don't know the man at all and if you know jesus there has to be a change in your life i'm at the end now then we'll take a few questions by God's grace. Who are you? You are the bearers of either light or darkness. If you continue to make your people think that the way we act is right, you are an emissary of darkness you are not a bearer of light it's one thing to talk about the condition out of which we live and say we're keeping it real 
But hell, is that the way you want to continue to live and keep the reality of what the slave master and his children have placed our people in? Is that the reality that you want? Or do you want something better for yourself and better for your people? Well, how will you get something better if you don't raise their consciousness to aspire for something better? That's our job. The artist is the most important person. You are the teachers. The people listen to you. They don't listen to their preachers. Preacher's day is done. If he's not a part of the revolution, he's finished. The young people in the street not listening to preachers, except preachers are preaching that which is right for the time. That which inspires people to get up from where they are and make a change. My brothers, my sisters, you must be bearers of light. And if you are a bearer of light, you are a creator of change. Nobody can do it better. And those of you who are artists in this room. I had a talk with Carmen a few days ago. And as I look at youth all over the world, they're not listening to the leaders. These young white children are not listening to Bush. They don't know Bush. They don't know Cheney. When they were running for president, ABC went into the white community and showed them a picture of Kerry, Senator Kerry. Who is this? Mm -hmm. And who is this? This was the vice, vice president of Dick Cheney. Who is that? Mm -hmm. Then they showed them a picture of Russell Simmons. They said, oh, that, that's Russell. They know the hip hop mogul, but they don't know the white folks that lead the nation. So who's leading the nation? It's you. You are not conscious of how powerful God has made you in the wrong direction. But if you turn in the right direction, you will spark revolution all over the world. But it's not a revolution of bloodshed. Watch this. Can I have five more minutes to talk? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Watch this. You know, Brother Farrakhan is known in many of these Muslim lands, and they love me because of my strength, which doesn't come from me. It comes from my submission to the will of God, but they admire it. And guess what? In a country like Iran, where they don't like nothing out of the West, these young people steal away. They ain't stealing away to Jesus. They stealing away to Common and Kanye West and Public Enemy, and they grooving in Iran. You are big in Africa. You don't know how much in the little jungle areas. They're grooving to you. You put a beat behind your lyric, and even some of the Africans now will say, Yo, nigga. <laughs> they didn't get it right because you didn't have it right. But if you had it right, they'd say, Yo, brother, how you doing? So you got to get it right now. And you know what? See, God is producing a revolution against you. As long as you're going to stay in funk and filth, this whole thing is going to turn on you. It is losing its value. And the enemy is getting to the point now where he sees that the moral decline of the nation 
is not serving him and his children. So watch how they want now to legislate against hip hop, but not against Hollywood. It's because you have captured the white folks' children. If 60% of hip hop records are bought by young white people, then who is their leader? 80%, thank you. Well, who's the leader? Well, I, I didn't want to be no leader. I just wanted to rap, man. Yeah, I know. I didn't want to be none either. <laughs> you know, it's just a fact. Well, now I either have to accept the role that God has given me. I can't be like Jonah anymore, and neither can you, hiding from your mission running away from what your real assignment is so the fish is swallowing you up but when that boy learned to pray he was spit up on dry land and he said i'm i surrender god i've been fighting you but i know it's time i hope that you will say i surrender god i, I know it's time that i can do better than what i'm doing Money is not more important than the rise of a suffering people into the fulfillment of the promise of God. Nothing is more important than your people becoming truly free. I am an admirer of Russell Simmons and Jay-Z and P. Diddy and Kanye West and all of you that are making hip-hop popular all over the world and you're rich some of you and you're trying to do something to give something back to the community which is admirable but if you notice the more you try to give back you don't ever change the condition of the masses of our people all you can do is make yourself feel better I helped a little community center. I did this. And no, no, no. It's, it's really good. It's not bad. You have a right to feel good when you give back. But if you look beyond your giving back to the mass condition, the masses are still suffering. And what the enemy has done is this. He made you a buffer for him. In years gone by, those that managed us, those that were our agents, those that were our accountants, those that were the record executives, those that were the uh, owners of the record label, you never got true accounting for nothing that you did, we did. And every one of our great artists, they died with nothing. And the record company executives were rich sending their children to college. The brother with the temptations, David Ruffin, he called me one day and he said, Brother Farrakhan, I'm out here in New Mexico with some Arab Muslims. They, they're not your kind, he said, and sometimes they pay me with money and sometimes they pay me with drugs and I want to get away from them. I said, David, <clears throat> I'm on my way overseas. I'll be gone for two weeks, but when I come back, I'll give you a call and we'll hook up and I'll try to get you free from that. When I got back from overseas and I called, the number had changed. I never got in touch with my brother. David Ruffin went to London, <clears throat> made some money and came home, they tell me, with $40,000 in a, a money belt. And he went to a crack house and they robbed him and they dumped him in front of Harlem Hospital. 
the doctors at Harlem Hospital, the people that worked there didn't know who that man was. And he died in Harlem Hospital, broke. He told his lawyer, if anything happens to me, let Brother Farrakhan say my eulogy. And I went to Detroit to funeralize my brother. And there he was laying in the casket with his glasses on, his children in the front row with no money because he was penniless. I loved Sammy Davis Jr. He died and the government came and took everything from him. His wife, Alta Vies, <clears throat> had to fight to get back a few little trinkets of value, but he died with nothing, making so many people rich. I looked on television and I saw my sister, <clears throat> who plays in this, this mo um, television series, uh, The Angel, um, Della Reese. And Della was grieving because she was on the set with Red Fox when Red Fox keeled over and died on the set. And she said the man was on the floor dead. And they were on the phone calling for somebody to replace him on the show. Who do you think you are to them? You are nothing but a piece of meat. And you're only as valuable as your last hit song. And when you make no more hit songs, nobody cares for you no more. Michael Vick. Well-paid piece of meat. He dared to train dogs to kill each other. If he did, but he was fooling with a man's best friend. <laughs> they never said what man, <laughs> but we know who's our best friend. It always has been God. But look at how your language has changed from brother to dog. Yo, dog, you are a God that has been turned upside down, yo dog. Ye are all gods, the psalmist says, children of the most high God. Don't you think it's time that we get up and be what God created us to be? Now what I was saying, and I'll close this point, today the enemy is wiser. Nat King Cole died. He didn't have a lot. All our great ones, Louis Armstrong, all of us, we had fame. But the white man had fortune. And we had fortune, but we squandered it because a fool and his money will soon part. Mike Tyson made over what? 300 million and now nothing. Joe Lewis <clears throat> who made our hearts leap ended his life as a doorman in Vegas. Sugar Ray Robinson one of the greatest that ever did it ended up tap dancing. Where will you end up? after you make no more hit songs. What is stored up for you and your children? Nothing. But those who have become multi, multi millionaires, right behind you is a Caucasian who opened the door for you to become rich. If you look at Oprah, look at all our black Rich, rich people. 
there's a white man somewhere behind that opened the door, let you make some to make you a buffer so that you can't speak against this that's behind you that opened the door for you and is killing your people. You can't talk no more because you're afraid you're going to lose the little something that he allowed you to have. So he's crippled us. He's taken the testicles away from men. And now you speak as though you have no strength at all. So the enemy is just crushing us at every turn. He's bought off most of the preachers with uh, faith-based initiatives. Put the money in your hand and then turn you and he can kill your people and you can't say nothing because you don't want nothing to be taken away from you. Now, we have a choice to make. I want us to become the children of light. Light is knowledge. Knowledge is here for you. You are not stupid. You are brilliant. But the question is, can you put your brilliance in a song? Can you put the condition of the world in a song and inspire young people all over the world to come away from the elites that are misusing their lives? Bush is misusing young people's lives. They're dying in Afghanistan. They're dying in Iraq for nothing. They have a right to love their country, but Bush does not have a right to misuse that love for oil. Suppose we started rapping to the young. Suppose the young start vibing to a rhythm that makes them peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the children of God. Suppose you took these little white children away from their racist parents and started educating them to follow you in an upward journey, not a downward journey. The whole world will follow you if you will follow God. If you will follow the inspiration of your own soul that punishes you at night. Because no matter what you have, it can't give you happiness. You're rich and empty. You like the what is it, the, that fine car that, oh yeah, the Phantom or the Maybach, and you lay back in your Maybach. <laughs> but after you lay back in your Maybach, you say, what's up, Jack? <laughs> say, something is happening because I ain't happy with this. I thought when I got that big house on the hill, I would be happy, but I'm in it and I'm empty. I thought when I had all the women that want to give themselves to me, and I took as many as I could, but I ain't happy. Because happiness ain't with things. Happiness is when you find your purpose in life and fulfill it. May God bless us to be the leaders of a cultural revolution. May God bless you. Can't you see that this hip hop thing is changing? And don't let the enemy get in front of it because he's watching the trend. Don't let him be the one to say, clean it up because he can make some money if you clean it up. You clean it up. Whether he's behind it or not, you clean it up because we're going to back you. We'll tear up the office. 
we, we can't take this no more. I'm telling you, an army is coming up. And that army will kill you if you don't get out of the way or lead the way. You can't stay like you are. Thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum. saw the picture of the kingdom. See, they were saying Allahu Akbar and pulling down things and killing people. But when we say it, we mean God is great. God is great in our lives. Whether we are Christians or Muslims or agnostics, God is great in our lives. I'd like to take a few questions. Is it all right? Would you like to sit down, sir? No, 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 right, no, we have, no. We have a comfortable chair. You know, I just want to say this. You know, when the press talks about Farrakhan, they say, the ailing Farrakhan. <laughs> well, you better go back and tell them. You was with Farrakhan today, and he was not ailing. No, no, no. Farrakhan is back. God has brought me back. I'm working 18 hours a day. So if they don't like Farrakhan, they got 50 more years to deal with me. That's right. I hope. <laughs> so anybody has a question, I'll try to answer. Greetings, how you feel? Salam alaikum, brother. Wa alaikum salam, brother. Um, it's very difficult being the first one to ask the question, but there's something burning in my heart that I have to Go right ahead, my brother. How do we, as revolutionaries, approach not only youth groups, but how do we approach the elders in those civil rights organizations to get them to understand, like you just said, that old way is dead, it's a wrap. There's a young spirit that's coming up that needs to be heard, and they're going to be heard regardless. That's right. I think the scripture says, in the last days, every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow. You're going to come willingly or unwillingly, but you're going to come. So since we are coming and we're ushering in that new spirit, what is the methodology? How do we get across these things? I've Thank been, you. Okay, yes, I sir. Got it. Thank I you. I got it. All right. All praise is due to Allah. First, let me say, the youth, that's where the enemy's aim is because this is a generation like we've never had before. Our young people are the strongest, the most fearless, and the best generation that we have ever produced because they are the agent of change. It's just that they need guidance. If you study the Bible from the Old Testament to the New, particularly Moses, see, the old folk, they didn't want to fight. They wanted God to do everything for us for them. <laughs> I'll get to us in a minute. <laughs> so when Joshua and them spied out the land and came back, they say, hey, there's some giants in the land. So Moses and Aaron said, well, you know, we should go. Go on in the land. So the old folks said, well, no. Oh, them is giants up in there. So tell God and Moses and Aaron let them go in in front and clean the giants out. Then we'll come in. And the God said, let them wander in the wilderness till they die out. And I will take their children and they will inhabit the promised land. That's our young people. They're warriors. But they're fighting each other. They're warriors, and the enemy is misusing their pain, their anger, their bitterness, and turning it on one another. Now, you've got to speak to the youth. 
and speaking to the youth, you can't use, if you pardon the expression, punctified language. Because you will miss the youth. You know that, Professor Griff, because you've been talking to the youth with a strong language. And if you talk to the youth right, and when I say right, I mean right up to the time, and you're on it with a good beat, the youth are hearing. But you said, how do we get over to the elders? Because the elders um, can't seem to get it together. Here's the way. You got to look at what has got the elders captured. See, they're captured by religion. They're captured by the Bible. If you don't know the Bible, you can't reach the elders. And if you know the Bible and put the Bible in the language that you capture both the youth and you bring the elder to see what the thing is by the use of scripture. And I'll tell you this, you just can't talk just to be talking because you're talking to the people of God. And the people of God move when they hear the word of God. So when you go into that word and take that word and translate that word into the action that the time requires, you get the young and you move the old. And the old will say, well, I may not be able to walk like I used to walk, but I'm with you young people. That's the way I do it. And I don't miss, by the grace of God, I can talk to those in the cradle and I can talk to those on their way to the grave because God is never without the ability to communicate with his creatures. Neither are you. But you've got to learn the word. See, and if you learn the word and put the word right, I'm telling you, the elders would say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Preach on, Professor Griff. I didn't know that hip-hop was that. I didn't know that you all could spit the scriptures like that. By taking a scripture and make it relevant to what the people are suffering and where you want the people to go and just put it in a rhyme with a good beat up under it. Before you know it, these children will be talking wisdom because they're not listening to nothing but you all. May God bless you to do that. Thank you, Professor Griff. Another question, please? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Brother has the mic. Um, first of all, I just want to say, man, I mean, I'm genuinely overwhelmed. See? This is a beautiful human. That's a great man right there. See? Ask him. Go ahead, Killer Mike. I mean, you know, before I was ever Killer Mike, I was just Michael Rand. I grew up west side of here, 15 minutes west of here. And um, I've been a follower and a listener, a study and admirer. Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan, I was 15 years old. And um, coming out of mosque number 15 under Van Muhammad, Brother Van Muhammad brought in the mosque. Yes. By um, formerly Conrad Muhammad's brother, formerly Shannon Muhammad, Shannon yes. X, Shannon Jones, now at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Yes. So um, I know, and there's no other way to say it, I know, and um, it's called for me to be in clash with people within the industry. And, you know, clash in high school with teachers. And when you know, you feel a more responsibility, regardless of the music. When you say something, you say something. I haven't had the hit songs that a lot of my contemporaries had. I haven't had the, um, the vanity recognition a lot of, I've had. But I'm in the same circles because I've always stood on integrity and respect because it was always what was expected of me, of the men that were surrounding me. My father, who introduced me to Islam, Michael Rinder Sr., Brothers of the Nation, even Brothers of the Sunnis, who got me later. And I'm, I'm glad I'm kind of calm and composed myself. I was telling my brother no ID earlier, I have a hard time being in your presence. 
I feel a lot like that rich man who just asked Jesus, you know, what do I need to do? Or that woman who wanted to touch his garment. So I want to duly acknowledge that you are God's force and you've moved in my life for over half my life. And I appreciate you so greatly, more than you will ever know. And I realize with the persecution of Griff and with the persecution of Chuck, that that was an example. As a child, I realized that, that this is what they're going to do to you if you choose to align yourself in any way with this man publicly. This is a lesson for the rappers who are coming after. I realized when Clinton attacked Sister Soldier, that was letting them sisters know, don't you get too conscious and don't you teach those children. And I've said these things in song and out. And I'll continue to do it. It doesn't matter to me if I ever sell a million, if I never sell any. That doesn't matter to me. Because I was raised on the principles of manhood. I met with you last year. And in speaking to you, you gave myself, Ludacris, um, yeah, you gave the boy, um, Too Short, you gave us this message. Much more palatable. You didn't get as fierce with us. You talked to us lovingly. And I know I don't understand that time is coming. But I don't think the people in this room, and I don't even mean the rappers and my contemporaries, people... They don't understand the game they stepped into. When I spoke to you at that time, I was ready, honestly, to set it on Al Sharpton. I was so angry and so filled with rage that he jumped right behind the rappers and he went to the man behind him and said, I'm going to ask you to legislate and stop this. And I was angry because I felt like, once again, a black preacher had snubbed us and you stopped me dead cold in my tracks. And you gave me about 10 minutes of talking that brought me all the way back down because I forgot in my anger and in my vanity, because I'm a rapper, I dare you attack where am I living. My vanity caused me to want to do some of the same things that have been done in the past that split us. And you warned against that. I sat in the same room and I warned my brother David Banner against that. And they laid the trap eloquently and they turned what was really about black men, not even just in Gina, not even just with Tip, not even just with his other stuff, not even with Vic, they turned it into two black men arguing versus two black men arguing against the lies of power with truth. And you gave me a lot. So I just want to just defer comment. I want to just sit. And I just want to hear you tell them, that because they don't understand, Minister, that when we stepped into hip hop and when we got money, you became a politician. You are so much more than a rapper. We feel as though we rapping, we represent what's real, and that ought to be enough. When you said we stepped into a game bigger than we know, we don't understand we're on the world stage. I've been to over four countries now. I've been to over four continents. I've been to many different countries. And the one thing I see when I go in every country, I see an Ice Cube shirt, a Tupac shirt, and a Niggas With Attitude shirt. <laughs> the police, the life and death side, and we all know Tupac's legacy. They don't have a concept of how global their message is. They have no concept that no longer are you just rappers because hip hop was never rap. It was a self-motivation force to transform the lives of people in the South Bronx, and it became a worldwide force to transform the lives of everybody, and we have zero understanding of it. The black managers and executives that say that they understand have no understanding because they're more worried about four first week members than they are systemic change over 52 weeks of the year by the music. They have no understanding that the words of revolution, when they say F the police because they were harassed and comped and harassed in Atlanta, a tip was caught by the ATF, they have no understanding that this affects young men in Rwanda, that it affects the struggle in the fuel. They have no understanding, they have no understanding of the true global impact that they have. They have zero understanding of what aligning themselves in front of or behind closed doors with men. The preachers have been bribed and taken out of the equation. The government bribes women to keep black men out of these countries. And when you say this, people look at you as though you're a fool. I got money or I get money. I just want you to help people in this room understand the truly global effect that an A&R will have when he says, I'm going to stand with you with this song. And we're going to make this song work. I want you to people with their vanity titles of VPs and presidents of these so-called companies that get fired very easily, as easily as a UPS, a UPS worker can keep his job longer than some brothers in this room, because he's a member of a union. Yet we have no real unions amongst us. We have no real unions that align us together formally or informally. 
And I would like for you to speak to that because these brothers have no idea of how truly connected we are. They have no understanding that what's happening in the South happened in South Africa. And if freedom and emancipation can happen there, it can happen here. I just need you to really get to the core. Stop going easy on us. Give it to them. Help them understand that you're beyond where you thought you at. <laughs> we don't understand that when we speak against war, they would like to kill us like Dr. King. They would like to take one of us out like Mac was taking. Say, well, he's the fault. He's the fault. He's the blame. They don't understand that if, if government organizations will turn SNCC against the SCLC, what you think they'll do with grind time and purple ribbon? And I've been a part of it. And I want to apologize. I want to make peace. Last March, I was, after, it's after I, was, I was in the room with Big Boy with you, and we listened, and we heard that message, and we just engaged in sheer stupidity publicly. And we took a legacy that they had been building for five years, and we drug it through the mud. And I have been a part of that. And I want to apologize to Dee Dee. I want to tell the members of the hip-hop community, I apologize for my part. But I really want you to speak to, and, and if you don't speak to nobody else, just speak to me. Because I want to do it right and not wrong, because I'm tired. I'm tired of seeing my people fall. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear it for brother. Mm. Thank you, brother. I'll just say a few things. You know, as I ended my talk, I gave a hint of something that's coming. You never want the anger of the masses to turn on us because we fail them in the most crucial hour that we are in right now. I thank you, my dear brother, for what you said. But most of all, I thank you for your spirit because I believe that spirit is really the spirit of most in this room when the veneer is taken away. You know, and we really look at ourselves and look at our potential power and look at the degradation that's among our people. I'll close this by saying two things. One, Once you make a stand for what is right, you must be willing to suffer at the hands of the enemy of right, but you will be the winner. See, I already know that we are the winner. I can't take sides with the enemy of what is right for my people, even if I die in the struggle, because Life is meant for a purpose. We are born to die. It's just how you die. And for what reason you die that makes your living and your dying worthwhile. So if you fear reprisal for standing up for right, you're not a good leader for your people. You got to be willing to walk behind the master teacher, the master revolutionary. And he said, if any man would be my disciple, he must first deny himself, then pick up whose cross? Say it again. His cross. Not Jesus' cross, not Muhammad's cross, your cross. Because there's always a cross when you stand up for right in a world as wrong as this is. But you got to be willing to pay the price to free your people. Otherwise, you're not akin to the ancestors who died to give us this time today. See? So you're in the valley of decision now. Some of us going to punk out. Oh, yeah. It's always somebody that 
got an excuse. But then you'll be seen. Especially when you look in the mirror. And you'll be seen by others as one who failed the test. But if you had unity, if you had unity, you would not suffer. Believe me, we stand up for what is right together, they'll bow down. And if they can make you afraid, then you bow down. But when you are in unity, you see fear come into them. And you get your way. Now, here's the consequence of step number two. See, what rap has done or hip-hop has done, it has put us in a light where now we are killing each other and the enemy is planning to kill us all. I'm going to say it again. We are actually living in the valley of the shadow of death. Now, if we keep killing each other, other with our beefs. We're, we're uh, uh, operating on such a low level that you're going to smoke your brother over some little beef and here God has come to put you on top and you are killing the people of God and you don't think there's a consequence for that? And what is the consequence? The Bible says that those who did not want to follow Moses and Aaron and rebelled against their guidance, they were bitten by fiery serpents. And right now, the enemy in all these armories has built up weapons, um, armored personnel carriers. Please listen. They're changing the highways now, particularly around urban centers, so the tanks can roll. The same thing you see in Israel among the Palestinians, where they have nothing but helicopter gunships, jet planes, high powered weapons against people with nothing. So the enemy has given us a chance to get a little weapon. And we're killing each other with it. But soon, he's coming. And soon, he'll be killing us wholesale. We can stop it. But if we continue on this path, of promoting the killing of one another, then God himself will chastise us with a chastisement that was never seen in the annals of the history of prophets. Now, you either will come up right or you will answer with your life. I'm not talking just to be talking. I know it's on the way. And if you open your eyes, you can see the enemy already. He don't care nothing about you marching in Jenna. He done put the boy back in jail to show you he don't care nothing about what you do. It's getting to the point where it's either throwdown time. And you are the one to wake your people up. And unite them. And God will defend and protect us. But we're going to have to be willing to pay the price that every oppressed people pay when they really want to be free. Damn it. And that's the question. Do you really want to be free? Or do you want to leave another generation to still fight the same enemy that we are fighting today that our fathers fought yesterday and our grandfathers fought the year before. We cannot afford to lose another generation hoping that white folk are going to treat us better. Right. 
look into Washington. If we are not in unity, we can't force the Justice Department to do right by us. So we're going to have to unite and be willing to pay the price to be free. It's better to be dead than to live like we are living. You don't have any life. Look at your people. Beautiful young black girl in West Virginia. But it's because of us that don't love and respect our women enough that a white man could do that to a black woman and expect nothing in return. Go ahead, man. No people allow their women to be hurt and they don't come back with something. What kind of men have we become? And as long as your woman is a bitch and a whore in your mind, You'll never stand up for her. And if you won't stand up for her and the children that she produces for us, it is better that we be dead. And soon you will be. We got to stand up. Thank you for asking me to say it like that. <laughs> Last question. Brother oh, Min sister, Hi. and you, you'll be the last. Yes, my sister. Brother Minister, um, you may not be familiar with the type of music that I do, obviously, or I could be a rapper. I'm not a rapper, but I'm a rapper, but I'm a part of the hip hop community. I grew up on hip hop. My name is India Davenport. I'm a part of a band called the Brand New Heavies. And I'd like to know, Obviously, this being a very male-dominated business, it's been very, very challenging for women in this business. Um, I also, being a victim of a circumstance that dealing with a major record label, depending on how you're looked at as basically a specimen, if you're halfway decent looking or if you're not, and to be asked actually to basically rip yourselves of your yourself of your integrity and to be asked to basically shake your behind. I understand. And basically, I, understand. I have been victimized in this particular capacity to the fact that the public does not know these types of things that go on behind closed doors and what we have to deal with. But it's at the same time, it's so insulting as a woman, firstly, and as a black woman, secondly, it's so offensive to actually be ridiculed in this particular way and my question in some respects is that how does this actually continue and increase our self-esteem and help us to stay on that path to because obviously I did not choose to do that and I won't do that those not those aren't the principles that I do music that's not actually what I want to portray as far as a legacy of what all the people before me have put forth that's not what I'm about and I'm not trying to do that so I'm basically trying to say for in response to myself and all the women that are in this business, how do we actually deflect some of these negative images that are directly put upon us? Thank you very much. See, we as men permit this. We as men promote this. We sometimes promote the degradation of our women and our girls for profit. <clears throat> when I was a young man, I was a Calypso singer. And when Harry Belafonte was in a Broadway show called Almanac, and he went out to California to do the movie Common Jones, I was asked to come in to New York to try out for his part. Now, uh, you don't know me as that. But ain't much out there in that that was better than I. But I would not bow down. 
I don't give a damn what you offer. You can never offer me anything. It takes me away from the principles that I'm bound to. Some of the producers were homosexuals and they liked the way I looked. Well, you know, there's a part for you, brother. <laughs> you don't have no part for me. Because, see, my talent was sufficient. If I can't get there on my talent, there's no bedroom action that will give me what my talent and my God can give me. Because what God has for you can no man take away from you. And what God don't have for you can no man give you. So we got to be men. Listen to this now. That honor and respect the womb that bore us. And every time you see a woman, you see a womb. Potential or actual. That is God's workshop. Allah says in the Quran, I created you in the womb. And I formed you in the womb. It's not your mama doing it. It's not your father doing it. It's God doing it. And when that womb that is so precious brings forth life, it can bring forth genius. It can bring forth prophets. It can bring forth scientists to remedy all the ills that we hope to see remedied. That's why women are sacred. And you, as a woman, must not allow yourself to be a plaything. See, you disrobe because that's the style. You want men to see your bosom. You want men to see. Bootylicious. You want men to admire you on the cheapest level. And what they see is what they get. Why don't you want them to admire you for who you really are? Because who you really are is not boob or butt. Who you really are is who you are. And that's what a man can't deal with. He can deal with the boob, he can deal with the butt, but he can't deal with your mind. And that's why you're divorced and you're single mothers because you haven't got a man yet that know how to deal with your mind. I'm saying to the men in the house, We can't permit record executives to talk to our women anyway. We got to stop them in the office. Hold it, Mr. Levine. Hold it. Oh, hell, if you can't talk, call me. I've been in their company. What's the big man's name? Edgar Bronfman. I've been in his penthouse. Um, it got quiet in there, didn't it? <laughs> Mike Wallace and our brother that used to manage Big Daddy, the fighter, Rock Newman. Rock Newman Mike Wallace and Rock Newman were friends, and this man, Mr. Bronfman, wanted to meet me. So I said, yes, I'll, I'll be glad to come. And there was a penthouse apartment on Fifth Avenue, and me and my son and Brother Sharif and my wife and other, we went to the apartment. And Mr. Bronfman came out and his dear wife, and we sat down, and he said, um, Mr. Farrakhan, would you like a drink? I said, oh, no, sir, thank you. Uh, I don't drink. 
He said, do you drink orange juice? I said, yes. He said, that's me. He said, do you go to the movies? I said, yes, occasionally. He said, that's me. He said, do you listen to music? I said, yes. He said, well, that's me. He was trying to impress me but how powerful he was. I said, Mr. Bronfman, I really don't care how powerful you are. I said, because when God gets ready for you, all of your power can't hold you here one second after the decree of death has been passed. When we got to the table for dinner, he was talking that smack again. <laughs> well, I just got to tell you, see, it's, it's wonderful to be free. I mean, I am a free black man. And I tell the Congress, don't threaten me that you're going to bring me. Bring me. Because I got something for you. And it don't come from Farrakhan. It come from God. See, when you know God, can't nobody punk you. I ain't talking about a God that I don't know. Otherwise, I'd have been dead a long time ago. So Mr. Bronfman started talking. And I said, there's a verse in the Quran that reads, if there's a gnat or anything smaller that took a morsel of bread out of your plate, Mr. Bronfman, you don't have the power to call the gnat to bring that morsel back and drop it on your plate. So the Quran says, weak is the invoker, and weak is the invoked. I can't bow down to a man that can't call a gnat. And I'm not going to let you call me like I'm one of your punks or your slaves. See, when you stand up like a man, God stand with you. And if you're going to die, then damn it, die like a man. Otherwise, we can't claim to be the children of those great ancestors of ours. Sister, I put it on us first. Because God expects us to be the protectors of our women. So when a fine looking woman comes in the room, we as record executives, we looking at her too. She's fine, ain't she? Let's see how much she wants this record contract. This is my granddaughter. Stand up, Jamila. Come here, baby. She just was in New York at Rockaway and did a nice commercial because they see her tall and, and beautiful. <laughs> but they recognized when they saw her, she's pretty, but she don't need what you offer. Not bad enough to lose her dignity and her virtue to be on some record label. And you're not going to get her to show her butt as a model. To hell with you. Force men to respect you. Make men see who you really are. See? So when they saw decency in the girl, they came at her different. But they mean, mine is still the same. But my son Mustafa is right there. <laughs> and I'll tell you frankly, see, we will kill over our women. We will make concrete water for our women.
And that's the way Elijah Muhammad taught us. He said, kill them for the honor and respect of your women. Now, I'm just telling you the way I was taught. And we didn't play that. We did it. What'd you say? In that order. Black men have to be trained like that. And then when we're in these high positions, and if my brother, what he said is true, that a UPS driver got more apparent longevity. Well, we don't need a union. We just need unity. If we are in unity, that's our union. But look, executives, you tell the owner, uh, we, we, we are not going to allow you to talk to our sister like that. You're going to have to clean up your language. Well, look, we'll fire you. You may, but not before I fire on you. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but when you start standing up, they'll go behind the door and say, something's happening. Black women are not for sale. And sisters, you hold yourself. Nothing is more important than your virtue. A record contract can never give you your virtue back. And the Bible says there's nothing more valuable. She's more valuable than silver and gold. A virtuous woman. And that's why when Muslims, they say, we, we, we are willing to martyr ourselves because we'll go to heaven and there'll be 70 virgins up there. And so many of our Christian family misunderstand. If all the people that martyred went to heaven and they're still virgins, <laughs> then they didn't go there to copulate with virgins. But what it's telling you is what heaven is composed of. It's composed of virtuous women. And when you got women that see their bodies and their womb as God's chamber where he produces the Jesuses, the Mohammeds, the Abrahams, the Moses of the world, and you see yourself like that, then you pay honor to that that makes you the child of God. So 70 virgins, man, that's a heck of a place. We in a place and everybody in it, all the girls in it is virgins. Well, that's a nice place to be. And you better know how you act. Because in our world, we kill you. The world of Islam, our law, Oh, no, no, no. See, our law is kind of tough. You're not going to be a pedophile in our world. Our world, we just take you out. And there's no long wait in time, you know. Brother, over there in the Holy Land, I was over there, and this, these couple of Filipino workers had raped a few of the sisters. They caught them. No long trials. People ain't paying tax dollars to feed criminals. They took them out in the stadium, and all the people gathered. And somebody came out with a sword and put him down and chopped their head off. And the whole crowd said, Allahu Akbar. See, you may say, that's terrible. Yeah, it might be. But you know where to keep your penis. 
See, when you got to die for pleasure, you'll think a lot before you try to get it. See, this is a, this kind of law that is here. This is not God's law. See, God don't play with us. See, you can't say you want God. See, God, man, he's a tough dude. Well, we're not ready for that yet. I just be frank. We're not ready. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he was so kind. He was so merciful. But he made us love right so that we could live in that kind of world and never be worried about nobody cutting off our hands for stealing. But I was in Mecca, and they had these money changers. And you could look and see the safe open with all kind of money in it. Ain't nobody, nobody, <laughs> nobody messing with that stuff. And when it's time for prayer, the merchandise on the table, they put a little sheet over it. And we go on to prayer and come back. Everything is right there. Brother Akbar and I were in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. We went to prayer and he left his watch. A few hours later, he came back. His watch was right there. Because the price that you pay for stealing, they wait until after prayer on Friday. And then off go your hand. That's tough law. But you know what? We're not ready for that. The world is not ready for that. That seems barbaric. But if you look at what we're doing to one another, that is barbaric. And only strong law will correct it. Now, I'm going to leave that alone because we're not there. And I don't want to frighten anybody. No, it's true. We're not ready for that. Because you have to bring your people up and strengthen them first. Don't hurt them because they are weak. You bring them up. And that's why, brother, when I talked to my brothers, you said, you should just, you know, get it, give it to them. Mm -hmm. But the Bible tells me to speak gently to those that are with young. Here are leaders that have thousands and millions of people following behind them. I can't treat you like you don't deserve respect and honor. So I talk to you out of respect for who you are, hoping that I will touch your heart by God's grace in such a way that the thousands and the millions that you lead, that you will be gracious and lift their consciousness. But it's, it's the way it should be. And I hope that I was able to get over to you what I needed to get over. And the last question will come from our brother First and foremost, I want to thank Allah for you. <clears throat> thank I want to thank you, Allah that allowed me to stand in front of you and tell you that I love you. Thank That's you. the first thing, okay? Um, I had the opportunity to come to your home. I brought Will Smith to your house and Jazzy Jeff to your house. Joined the nation in 1990, okay? Came to the Million Man March. Brought them there as well. Took an oath. He told me, go back to my community and be a man, step up, a man up. I want to tell you that uh, this Sunday, I asked for 10,000 men to come together in Philadelphia to stand up for our people, for our seniors, for our mothers, yes. for our wives, and for our children. Yes. I go up to the prisons. I, I deal with the uh, Youth Study Center in Philadelphia, and I deal with Greater for Prison. You got lifers up there, but they're not lifers. They're architects. Okay? I'm working with them right now to make a difference, but the Daily News of Philadelphia is doing everything in their powers to try to make this not go down. Okay? Working alongside a Captain Dennis Muhammad. Okay, and I come, I come here to, for you to put your hands on me, to pray for me, that when, I, when we go there this Sunday, that we'd be victorious, because that's what's going to happen. Thank you. Okay, and I need all of y'all to stand up for Minister Farrakhan. Again, don't take this for granted. This man is a great man. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Brother, 
Thank you. Can, can, I, can I just, can I just, can I just speak yes, sir. Because I'm yes, sir. Because again, I, when I get when I get around you, I don't want to say anything. Again, I don't want to say anything. I'm glad I'm able to look you in your eyes again and say I love you. Thank you so much. So glad. Now again, um, ooh, Mike, I love that. I love that. You got a lot of brothers in here, but um, I just need you to tell me what it is. Captain Dennis said you said don't be peace take be peace keepers, be peace makers. We can't keep something that we don't have. And again, we got, we got young brothers that's 12 years old, 13 years old, 14 years old, in adult facilities right now in Philadelphia. And the city of brotherly love is the number one homicide city in the country. The very place where I grew up at, okay? 1985, I shot myself. I laid in the bed and I asked God, please. I almost took, I took myself out of here. I had a colostomy on me for eight months, couldn't walk. I said, please, if you allow me to get up out this bed, I will do everything in my powers to make a difference. So I got a chance to go all around the world in the process of making my Ali that we'll start in, we got a chance to be with Nelson Mandela and Ali for two and a half years. I told Will, I said, listen, you cannot have that experience of about 160 years and just come back and rap and act. We have to do something, okay? Now, I'm saying, even if it didn't work through him, he supports everything that I do, okay? And even if, it, even if it's not him stepping up, I'm stepping up, and I'm doing everything that you asked of us to do. It took me 12 years to get it together, but I got it together, and I ain't gonna let nobody stop me. And again, whenever a lie calls on you, and if I'm still here, know that you got a soldier down here, six, seven, 280 pounds, that will ride and die for you. And so will I ride and die yes, for you. Yes, sir. So, so, so another thing, <coughs> I'm saying, I, just need you, I just need you to pray for me. Yes, sir. Pray for me. I need you to pray for these young brothers, because they're waiting to be certified. Like I said, there's 12-year-old kids up there that's waiting to be certified, turn 17 years old, they send them to the penitentiaries, and there's no way in the world they're going to come back out of society. You feed them to the wolves, they're going to be a wolf. Thank you. Thank you so much. In closing, you will be successful because God wants you to be successful. And there's a verse in the Quran that I read the other day during our Ramadan fast. It said, I did not reveal the Quran to you that you may be unsuccessful. Why would, why would the news, wait, why would they do this if what you're calling for is young black men, 10,000, to walk for life, to stop the violence in our communities? Why would they oppose that? because they are your natural enemy. And the problem is we have not recognized our open enemy because there's some of them that pat you on the back and you smile while their brother is around the corner ready to strike. And so you just got to be wise today. Oh man, you will be successful. And we will pray that God will bless your effort to be successful. In fact, I think we all should end this with a prayer. I mean, I, mean, I can't end it. Somebody's going to come behind me and end it. But maybe we should pray. And ask God to open our hearts and our minds that we may become the emissaries of light that vanishes the darkness that our people walk in. I always ask God to put his light above me, beneath me, and around me, and anoint me with his spirit, because it is only his spirit that has the power to change the harsh realities of our life. Let's have a prayer. Please. O oh Allah, guide us among those whom you have guided aright. Preserve us among those whom you have preserved. Befriend us among those whom you have befriended and bless us 
in whatsoever you grant us and deliver us from the evil of what you have judged. For you judge, and none can judge against you. And those whom you befriend are not disgraced. Blessed are you, our Lord, and highly exalted are you above what is set up beside you. O Allah, look upon these your servants, whom you have called to lead people by the tens of thousands and millions. Their hearts are open today for that which is better. Feed them the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that will give them light upon light. Make them emissaries of your light to a world that is suffering under the darkness of a satanic mind and a satanic rule. Help us not to be instruments of Satan, but make us your instruments of peace. We ask this of you in the name of your servants from Abraham to Moses to Jesus and Muhammad. And I ask this of you in the name of him who came to guide us, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. For I bear witness that there is no God but you who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. And I bear witness that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is your messenger, Messiah, and I am their servant. Ameen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you brothers and sisters. Thank you.